On this episode, we discuss Men in Black International. Brought to you by the International Mail Catalog, your number one source for sleeveless dusters. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Flop House. I'm Dan McCoy. Hey Dan, it's me, Stuart. Oh. Hey Wellington. Stuart. <laughs> hey, oh, okay. I'll wait till you guys say hello to each other before I, before <laughs> yeah. I introduce myself. Have you guys seen each other not that recently, or what's going I on? I mean, we actually haven't seen each other. Like the last time, I think was when we taped last. It's been a little while. Uh-huh. Been, well, we did a live show on Saturday. Oh, so it's that's been right. a week. It's been a week. No, <laughs> but you guys catch up. Talk <laughs> about what's happened. From my Tell each other about memory. your Halloweens, and I'll sit here and then I'll introduce myself afterwards. Uh, uh, no, I mean, we should probably just do the show. I mean, Dan yeah. and I could do this off I mean, mic. I can yeah, you? It, no doesn't, to... it seemed like you were ready to do it right now during the show. Like, this is a, the, 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 the audience doesn't tune in for this kind of passive aggressiveness. I mean, they do a little bit, but mostly <laughs> yeah. it's the friendship well, they enjoy. Yeah. I'll say I'm the third member of this Mouvage à Trois. That's movie watching with three mm-hmm. people. Uh, and my name's Elliot Kalen, but we also have a special guest today. You'll recognize her from television, movies, and print. That's right, the Triple Crown. She's the co-host of the all-new Max Fun podcast, Tiny Victories, and also the author of the upcoming book, You're Leaving When, which comes out in March of next year, I believe, 2021. And, most importantly to me, she was the host for many years of Dinner and a Movie on TBS, where I learned how to cook pasta when I was younger. So please welcome, help us in welcoming Annabelle Gerwich. Annabelle, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, hello, and I'm so glad you learned how to make pasta because I didn't <laughs> learn how to make anything. I We had a <laughs> chef on set with us, and actually, like, for, like, 24 hours, I would know how to make the dish that we made on the show. And then my uh, – just like that – the nebulizer in men in black series mm-hmm. yep. uh i uh i would it would, my memory would be wiped totally so uh i'm glad you retained some cooking skills from me the now, very the very basics the very Ellie, basics. yeah i wanted to i wanted to query this a little bit now when you say you learned how to query? cook pasta you uh, just do you mean it. uh that you learned how to like make the entire dish with the sauce? Are you literally just talking about cooking pasta? Because that is a pretty easy process. You just boil some salted water and put the the pasta in for between eight to 12 minutes if it's packaged dried pasta and maybe, you know, around three if it's a a newer pasta. I can't believe he's showing off. Dan, I don't don't appreciate you pasplaining to me (laughs) and cook shaming my lack of the general knowledge about cooking. <laughs> okay. I w- nobody's nobody's born knowing how to make pasta, Dan. You got to learn it from somewhere, <laughs> and my parents did not true. teach me, so I learned yeah. it from dinner and a movie. I mean, you could also learn it from the pasta box. That's the other place that people pick it up on the streets. You know. So I just yeah. see a box a box of pasta lying on the street, and you think I'm going to yeah. pick that up and read it thoroughly and then eat it? I don't think so, Dan. Okay, fair enough. Daniel, I did. I just feel like you want to take away the fact that I imbued some knowledge to Elliot. No, I no. feel like you're just like taking that away from me. It's like I feel like it's a life achievement. Okay, during this yeah. pandemic, I'm <laughs> hanging on to little, little tiny. Okay, tiny victories like having uh-huh, yeah. taught Elliot how to make pasta. Don't take that from me, man. Uh-huh. Yeah, Dan. Okay, Dan. Ooh. All right. I yeah. No, that's fair. That's fair. And I, what's that know, I see more, on your bookshelf my, behind you, Elliot? Is that a, an award for best pasta maker in <laughs> yeah. uh, Los Angeles? <laughs> yes. Well, thanks to Dinner and a Movie, I did go to CIA, the Culinary Institute of America, uh-huh. and I became a master pastologist, and I did uh-huh. win the L.A. Citywide Pasta Competition. Uh, and, yes, and as you can see, the yeah. trophy is... It's just gold pasta. It's just like gold linguine that's in a yeah. ball. It looks like a, <laughs> yeah, like a ball it of spells yarn. Out, it spells out that's a more, right? <laughs> no, no, that's no, no. It's actually in front of uh, a uh, one of those three dimensional paintings you see in like an older aunt's house where mm-hmm. it's like Hollywood and it's uh, a lot of tourist stuff and they've 
have pieces of wood that make it look like a three dimensional picture. Maybe okay. my aunt is the only one who had one of these, but that's what says that's a moray in the back. <laughs> I really, I really embraced my not my my New Jersey roots. I wasn't, I'm not Italian, but you know, when you're from Jersey, you're a little Italian. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, I just I just saw that Chris Christie is on cameo, and he got tricked. I guess. I don't know how much how much brain power does it take to is it okay if I say this trick Chris Christie? But I think it's I mean, totally okay. <laughs> all right, because he got tricked into making an endorsement video for a cameo for the Democrat a Democratic <laughs> candidate. Just, uh, first of all, you deserve it if you're on cameo and you're Chris Christie and you're for sale for a hundred dollars. I don't know. It's just hundred dollars. Like, I'm not is feeling sorry for him. Yeah. Maybe I'll uh, keep Chris Christie in mind while I, I put together my feature film that is made entirely out of uh, cameo purchases. <laughs> <laughs> well, so a- Annabelle, I want to apologize to you. My my verve and passion for trying to get Elliot back for the many uh, licks he's gotten in on me over the years uh, had the unfortunate side effect of... Uh, <laughs> there was a lot of blowback you. to that one, Dan. A lot of yeah. blowback. No, no, no. Uh, but I, I, listen, I, I, I loved doing that show because... My one of my favorite things are to is to talk about movies, and mm-hmm. uh, I, I I was a little bit ham. What is the word? Hamstrung? Ha- I was a little bit. Uh, okay, suddenly it sounded wrong because it was food. In it. No, uh-huh. it's perfectly right. Yeah. As uh, as as using the word query would have been for the, what I said before, but I. I mean, was... I've never heard it pronounced query, but you know, like scary. Query. <laughs> yeah, but query. I would say. Query. You, is more of a high highfalutin sort of uh, uh, British uh, pronunciation of the word that um, some yeah. in America use, but yeah. not the real salt of the <laughs> You're earth. Right. I guess like I should me. I should say it like I'm a backwoods frontiersman who's who's trying to find out if there's a raccoon or a See, it's pie the sort of outside my barn that has dro- driven Metal America away, Elliot. Uh-huh. Metal yeah. America. I'm a member yeah. of Metal Metal America. Dan, I love metal. <laughs> Judas Priest, my favorite band. Okay, I did not actually finish my sentence. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, that happens no, a lot here. No, but... no, it's okay, it's okay. But I was going to just say, I was I was acting at the time I did that show, and so sometimes I didn't read a movie, so I sometimes held back on certain opinions, and I, I really spend my time uh, writing now, and so um, I'm free to just totally... <laughs> oh, man, <laughs> take the gloves down. off. Woohoo! Yeah. Okay. And it's it's really just, people are ta- are just devastated by my reviews I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and havoc in the industry oh, yeah. yeah so uh, that's a, that's appropriate because this uh at first we thought this was going to be a, a pasta podcast and then we thought it was going to be a podcast about pronunciation but in fact it's a podcast where we watch a bad movie and then we talk about it right guys yeah that is that's the theory right. That's uh, the theory or, ther- or theory. I, you, I you guess I should the, pronounce it theory. That's the way Dan would say to pronounce it. You took the segue right out of my mouth, Stuart, and thank you for that because that thing was hurting. That was yeah, a, yeah. I ate a whole segue. Uh-huh. Yep. <laughs> um, no, uh, yeah, we watched Men in Black International with mm-hmm. a cavalcade of stars. You got your mm-hmm. Tessa Thompson, your Chris Hemsworth, Liam Neeson, mm-hmm. Emma Thompson. Yep. Uh-huh. Kumail Nanjiani does a voice. Yep. Uh, I feel like I'm forgetting. Oh, uh, Rachel Ferguson. Uh, uh, Rebecca Ferguson. Rebecca Ferguson. Sorry, uh, Rachel. I I can guarantee you've uh, Googled Rebecca Ferguson feet before, Dan. You can't remember <laughs> that mispronunciation. <laughs> uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, Rebecca Ferguson, he- who you may know from uh, uh, the Mission Impossible movies, the later ones, and uh, wearing a hat in Doctor Sleep. Yeah. Um, a lot of great about that hat. actors sure. in this movie, um, and Elliot, I believe you are talking about it, or is Stuart? I'll be I'll be summarizing this film today. Now, okay. just to keep get everyone back up to speed, because the old Men in Black movies have been a while ago now. Uh, they followed Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones as two sec- super secret agents who mm-hmm. were trying to uh, keep the Earth safe from aliens who are attacking Earth. By which I mean. Uh, fleeing to earth for a better life so uh it was only while watching this movie that i was like oh this movie is about like space ice these men in black movies are all about like if ice dealt with aliens and they're the heroes and also they erase people's memories routinely they're kind of the bad guys which is the place of men in black in ufo literature traditionally has been as bad guys who try to cover up real ufo sightings but uh those movies flipped it on its head 
and they made us love secretive, uh, semi-fascist policing using taxpayer-funded advanced technology that we never get to see. Anyway, yeah. Men in Black yeah, are International. They, are they a government agency? I, I, I can't remember. Well, in the in the original movie, it's I think they're a U.S. government agency, but here they are, as the title says, international. Yeah. So yeah. maybe the U.N. is funding them, or maybe they just do it for kicks. I don't know. I, I also want to note that um, there was actually a bigger gap between Men in Black 2 and Men in Black 3 than between Men in Black 3 and Men in Black International. There was a 10-year gap between the second one and the third one, because the second one was a big flop, uh, and there's only a seven-year gap between Men in Black 3 and this attempted sort of reboot with other characters. And what lesson can we draw from that, Dan? I don't know. I just thought it was kind of interesting. The the second one was a big flop? Yeah. That's the one with uh, Lara Flynn Boyle, right? I can't actually speak to uh, how it did financially. I don't think it did that well, but it was definitely not liked by basically everybody and the yeah. first one was a huge hit it was yeah. boffo bo and it, and that this mm-hmm. pick had legs hicks did not nix this sticks picks <laughs> and that's all the variety headlines i know so <laughs> let's talk about what happens in this one men in black international first off we know this isn't going to be a regular movie because the columbia pictures logo shows up there's columbia the personification of liberty in the western hemisphere and she slips on a pair of men in black sunglasses. Uh oh. At first, I thought that was a reference to the Joe Cool character from the Snoopy comics, but no, I think it's men in black. <laughs> no, okay. Wait, I just realized something. I think I watched the wrong movie. Oh, that's great. That's oh, perfect. we can describe it to you. Okay, so that will tell you the story of this one. Uh, this was okay, perfect. So then let <laughs> then. You'll be experiencing this movie for the first time the way it was meant to be done with me mm-hmm. t- telling you about it. So, yeah. Uh, we start off. It's Paris, 2016. And Chris Hemsworth and Liam Neeson, they're Men in Black London agents. They're called H&T. All the Men in Black agents. It's a movie. Uh oh. Which one did, did you did, did you watch the first one? Yeah, or did which you watch one another did you watch? one? Okay. I'm so. I must have like the worst case of COVID brain. It's I fine. watched. That it was so terrible. It was the one where they travel back in time. I think that's the third one. Oh wow! Which I would I would say is better than the second one. But I thought I was supposed to watch the third one. I sometimes when we send literature, it's uh, not super clear. Did you write when you uh, Elliot when you wrote the email <laughs> and you said Men in Black International? Did you just write three eyes? And that might seem like Men in Black Three. It's possible. <laughs> it's possible. Elliot sle- fell asleep at the keyboard in the middle of writing International, and he just like he like just his, his nose hit the eye multiple times instead well, pro- of finishing the word International. I have a typing problem called heavy finger, where <laughs> oh, my okay. finger sometimes lingers a little too long on some of the letters and multiplies them. Okay, well, uh, don't worry, we're still gonna have we'll we'll try to fit fit. I want you to actually while we're going through, I want you to tell me. If this was Men in Black 3, what would they be doing at this point? Because <laughs> I've never seen Men in Black 3, so Me I feel neither. like we could both teach each other this time. Okay, at this point in the movie, we are at the uh, Lunar Prison, the International. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It seemed international to me. Uh-huh, <laughs> How yes. would I? I mean, it was like they oh. were at the International Lunar Prism, Prism, uh-huh. Lunar Prison, where yeah. they were where a troglodyte kind of person uh, is, I mean, alien, is breaking out to come and uh, come back to Earth and wreak havoc, and they have to travel back in time to Tommy mm-hmm. Lee Jones's past yeah. uh, and to, uh, for Will Smith to, uh, to, to, to right a wrong that wasn't to finish uncompleted work. You know, yeah. when they do that in a, mm-hmm. in a sequel, mm-hmm. you know, the, the work that's, the, there was something left unfinished. Yeah, and they yeah. have to go back in the past and it's going to change everything. But this was the, what, what happens in that movie, I'm just going to give you the brief summary, is that was one of those movies where they seek to give you the backstory, the heartwarming backstory uh-huh. that you don't give a shit about. You just... <laughs> can't be fun but it was fun and funny and they're just gonna deny you that and try to pull it your heartstrings and you're like no 
that's not what I'm tuning in for. Give me my funny aliens. I don't want to know Will Smith's backstory. I just want to see him be charismatic and be Will Smith. That's the movie in a nutshell. Okay. I mean, this, there's similar stuff going on in this one, as you'll see. Uh, I will also mention, though, how, how great would it have been if he had to go into Tommy Lee Jones' actual past, and it's like he's on the set of Coal Miner's Daughter, and Will Smith is like, we got to stop these aliens. And he's like, I don't understand what you're talking about. Yeah. So we'll see that that movie sounds kind of like this one in some ways. So it's Paris, 2016. Agents H and T, that's right, Chris Hemsworth and Liam Neeson, they're from London, but they're in Paris, and they are they're kind of they're those kind of smug, like, uh oh, another adventure. Well, let's 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 stop this one, old buddy. And they interrupt a marriage proposal at the Eiffel Tower because the hive, a kind of vague alien menace that absorbs other species and planets, are invading Earth. Ah, can they stop them? They must have, because now we're in Brooklyn, and it, this is done as if it's taking place at the same time as that, but it's gotta be the nineteen nineties, because this is Tessa Thompson's character as a little girl, uh-huh. and the idea yeah. that she aged 20 years in the past four years doesn't make any sense. But no. it's it's weird that they would go to 2016 and then without saying the year again, go way beyond that. <laughs> but uh, Mo- this little girl, Molly, uh, she encounters a kind of like Stitch looking alien like Lilo and Stitch. Yep. And her parents That's are like... That's what it looked like. Yeah, the parents are like, there's an an- it's some kind of animal. And the men in black agents show up. They erase her parents' memory. But they don't erase hers, and she helps now, that alien escape by basically saying, go out that window right now. She doesn't really do now, that much to help it. Now, I want to talk about a problem uh, that I have with uh, the men, are, men in black uh, procedurally. Okay. Because sure. – uh, This is the right form for that, yes? Yes. Uh, so Liam Neeson and Chris Hemsworth and these two agents outside uh, young Tessa Thompson's uh, house do the same thing. They both – Explain what's actually happening, the alien thing that is actually happening. Yeah. And then they neuralized them. And I'm like, well, why are you explaining this to these people beforehand if you're just going to erase their brain? Especially when, in the second case, it allows Tessa Thompson to overhear you talking about aliens. (laughs) Yeah. Do you think that's part of the way the neuralizer works, where you have to, like, say... By, like, saying it, it brings it to the forefront of your brain, and then you're like, time to wipe that chalkboard clean. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I know. I have a problem with the procedural aspect, too, of all the Men in Black movies with that aspect, because I also feel like, why don't they show us the story of the actual repercussions mm-hmm. that happened from that one of just one in like, there's always like a yeah. crowd, right? Mm-hmm. And so like, like someone goes home and they're wife is really pissed at them because they can't remember where they were oh yeah likely story or does it just delete uh-huh. that time i mean i really need to know like sure. how yeah. that works somebody well, gets they, arrested but someone gets arrested by the regular police and they're like where were you last night when the murder took place i don't remember i wasn't uh-huh. there but i don't remember i didn't do it and they're like okay throw him away and the men in black are like we could testify on his behalf <laughs> but then we'd have to reveal there are aliens so yeah well, uh, sorry, they do buddy. fill in the everyone's memory with a false memory after they neuralize it that part makes makes sense to me it's just like why do you have to like it really feels like they're just like fucking with these people yeah, yeah. I mean, that's real, you. possibly part of it the real screenplay reason is they're explaining to the audience what's going on mm-hmm. uh but oh, it just right. i'm just like why why is this happening <laughs> but Thank it's you, another Stuart. one of those issues that i'm just gonna go super super serious with this series because you know it, it's it, it exists on so many levels that are troubling so yes there is this sort of fascist sort of element to the ICE group that, you know, the, uh, mm-hmm. itself, which is probably, I'm sure there's some Reddit somewhere, some Reddit thread that someone speculated that the ICE organization in Men in Black is funded by Bill Gates or something. Yeah. Yeah. But this, oh, is sure, in, yeah. this is in fiction, right? Not in the yeah, real yeah. Reddit or in real Reddit as well? No, in real Reddit. Okay. Real Reddit. You know, yeah, it's like, QMIV, like, yeah. There's, there's like this sort of like fascist, undercurrent of all the things the government's not keeping from you paired with the fuzzy uh, uh, cute alien universe because uh-huh. it's it, it's just sort of a funny di- dichotomy there that I it just it it's just a sort of a clash for me in the first men in black it was just all so silly and campy that I went with the sort of okay fascism <laughs> I'll go you know you're <laughs> 
fascism, right? And you're also you're also coming at it as an outsider. I feel like in the first movie, you are thoroughly with Will Smith, and you are coming at this world as an outsider. And there's something about an outsider who is like learning about this new world that is makes it slightly less scary. I well, know, I also I'm... don't. I mean, I don't want to be Men in Black apologists because, like, sure. sometimes they do seem to just be like, okay, these are uh, uh, illegal aliens. These are they haven't gone through the pro- pro- proper channels. But at the same time, like you go around Men in Black headquarters, there's plenty of aliens working there. They seem to be like cool with aliens in general. So there it, are you know, so a... many aliens. I yeah. feel like so much of the movie is people walking through rooms filled with aliens. Like I feel like when Guillermo del Toro was in the movie theater, he's like, "More of this, just more of this." <laughs> well, Don't it makes yeah. me, story. It, it makes me wonder why there's so many aliens that work there. Why are aliens a secret? Right, yeah, but also okay. Here's another anomaly of the movies, and and this what? is where I I think it I take it you know I, I'm taking this very take, I take these things very seriously. So, in the Star Wars uh, series, which I hold very sacrosanct because I am that kind of creepy person, uh-huh. um, you know, the aliens, the funny alien out costuming, and you know, like the job of the hut. Uh, uh, set pieces right uh-huh. in the bar that's intended as comic relief in the middle of a joseph campbell uh mythological uh heroes call to action film right mm-hmm. this is the co- continual uh saga being played out in star wars it's a serious movie then you get these funny aliens in the first men in black the funny it was all just funny aliens right but then i feel like they start to mix up their themes and then i'm not sure if the funny aliens are the point or if it's a, if it's what kind of i'm not sure what world we're in anymore i get very confused that's that's an issue that i had with this movie too cuz i was not sure when i was supposed to care about things or not or what was serious and what wasn't because well Let's get back into the movie. I think that's a good point. We go, so it's present day. And now Molly is all grown up. She's Tessa Thompson. And she's applying to all the, you know, the FBI, the CIA, trying to figure out how to join the men in black. But she keeps getting stonewalled. Luckily, at her tech support call center job, her computer can track space anomalies. Uh-huh. And she tracks the suspicious trajectory. I mean, she trajectory. probably, you know, installed a, an extra program. I, I'm guessing that what didn't come with, uh, well, I no, don't think she, IT put that on there. It's probably, probably the one she not. has in her apartment with the super killer graphics. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. she and she is logging in as a. An, Can I interrupt you for one second? I don't know if you you follow this sort of stuff, but as someone who once, you know, was like a, well, I was like always a Star Trek girl and stuff, and so mm-hmm. uh, I follow this stuff. But um, the intelligence agencies now allow for you to have smoke weed. I just wanted to mention that they didn't oh, use so much okay. on the applications. So. And just in case any listener is out there. Thinking of a career change during COVID. Are you recruiting? <laughs> is this like a backdoor recruitment? No, I, mean, like, I love the idea of like a, like a like a CIA agent who's like, "Hey, kids, you know what's cool? Uh-huh. Getting high and protecting your country." Yeah. I mean, now the one thing you know that was stopping me has been removed. I mean, other than the fact that I'm 42 and I haven't trained in any sort of you know analysis or geopolitics. People- have been uh, quarantining at home, thinking about a new career, smoking sure, a lot yeah. of weed. Yeah. Young people, young people just out of college, smoking a lot of their home. What are you going to do? And they're yeah. and now they're listening to this yeah. and they're thinking, okay. I mean, young people don't listen to this, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, a surprising number do. I don't know why, because they're all like yeah. these are all like middle-aged people references yeah. that we make yeah. for the most part. But uh, it's like uh, it's the comfort of uh, hearing your dad's weird friends in the next room. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, she, uh, but things are about to get a little bit more dramatic for Molly. She tracks this suspicious trajectory to a disguised crash site. There's like a hologram that makes it look like a construction site. But really, the men in black are taking away this alien. Everyone seems to know. He seems to be a famous alien. He's never mentioned again. Not a character in the movie. No. Uh, Molly He's just a repeat gets, offender, I think, is what's, what, what's being uh, But anyway. Mo- Molly gets into a classic New York City yellow cab. Follow that car. God, All right, it. whatever you say. I love, and, uh, man, seeing a person without a mask getting in a New York cab. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, the science so fiction, sad. am I right, Stu? Yeah. yeah. Uh, she follows them to Men in Black headquarters, and she tries to sneak in by walking right in. Like, she doesn't it have just, much of a plan. 
It just occurred to me is this is where she told them to keep the motor running, right? Is this Yeah, so he's still waiting like, for Like keep her. the meter running, sorry, I mean. Well no, he she tells him to keep the meter running when they get to the crash site, I think. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then she goes, follow that car. So Oh, okay. I thought yeah. I, I like in my head I'm like, wait a minute, did she just abandon that cab? Because if, if she did, we were denied the post credit sequence of that cab still waiting for her. Yeah. And the meter the is up cab. to like forty thousand dollars and he's like, exactly. This is gonna put my kids through college. Exactly. Yeah, yeah he's uh, rubbing his hands together. <laughs> he's like, This is gonna be the best fair I ever had. But he's yeah, like hungry he's, and he's, he's been holding in his, the ba- He's eating his shoes at this point. <laughs> yeah. he's got he got a really big has beard. to use the bathroom, but he can't he can't get out of the car. Uh yeah. So she gets caught and taken to O, played by Emma Thompson, the head of the office. Now, all the men in black agents worldwide are called by one letter, which leads me to believe there are only 26 men in black agents. <laughs> there's in the so many people world. in the and, office. And, and I guess four more in Spain. But yeah. it's like a, they don't – what do they do when they run out of letters? Guys, what do you think? Oh, they double it. It's like 007. Oh. oh. Double K. But what about double U? See, that's where you run into problems. Yeah. You gotta skip directly to triple U if you're gonna do that. <laughs> yeah, the double U agents are like, no, mm. d- God, please yeah. don't do double U me. Don't mm-hmm. double U me. Don't yeah. don't you don't you double U me. Don't you do it. Uh-huh. And you know that a- Molly becomes Agent M, and you know that she's she and Agent N are always getting mixed up. She's always getting Agent N's call, uh-huh. and uh, Agent M yeah. N is always getting Agent M's call. It's not a good system, I guess is what I'm she, saying. Yeah, she's always has to be like M, like in Marshmallow. Low when she mm-hmm. introduces herself to people. Exactly. And Agent B and D, it's it's not a good... Oh, anyway. So Emma Thompson is like, I've been impressed by your dedication to this and also how pathetically lonely you are because Tessa Thompson says that relationships just distract you from the truth. Now we know what she's about, learning how to love and trust. And mm-hmm. she recruits her as a probationary agent. She does not get her neuralizer until she completes her first mission. And the neuralizer, again, is the is the amnesia device. Yeah. <laughs> I love that that's the one thing you don't get. She gets to shoot all kinds of you know, extremely dangerous weapons, but the neuralizer is the one thing. They're yeah, because like, eh. it's too much. Uh, so now we go back to London. Chris Hemsworth is going undercover to infiltrate alien smugglers, but he gets caught by them. He gets bitten by a three-headed snake, and in exchange for the antidote to the snake poison, he sleeps with the smuggler's alien wife. So that's the kind of hero we got. He's somehow the best agent they've got, even though he's always messing up, always breaking the rules, and is like, having sex with his suspects that he's supposed to be watching. So yeah. how is he the best? He's like a Captain Kirk type where it's like he's the best of us, even though he does everything wrong and well, causes bigger problems. So I've got a little bit, I do have a problem with this arc, Elliot. I agree with you, but for slightly different reasons. Like we learn that his tragic backstory, like I'll, we'll talk about it in more depth later, but we learn that his tragic backstory is basically just a bad breakup. I mean, like there are extra levels to it, <laughs> yeah. but let's just say that. And it's, the way he acts is so out of proportion to that. Like, he used to be the best agent, and now he kind of is, like, halfway to a Captain Jack Sparrow type, where he's, like, this sort of, like, dissolute, like, he seems, like, sort of drunk, and he doesn't really t- care about well, Wait, what he's are doing you saying bit. Captain Jack Sparrow was a drinker? <laughs> <laughs> What? <laughs> I just assumed he got hit on the head with a coconut multiple times. Yeah. All the time. Well, he has a coconut tree at home on the ship, and it, yeah. the, the coconuts are always hitting him in the head. Yeah. Uh-huh. I, I mean, think, well, Dan, I think I think some of this cheaper. is. Some I mean, of this the is supposed to. Investment is higher. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> I mean, the coconut trees are palm trees are expensive. They're expensive trees to buy, but yeah. if you want coconuts, that's what you got to do. You're yeah, not going to get them from any other type of tree. Just no. try mm-hmm. it, Dan. I uh, tomorrow plant an oak tree. Wait forty years, fifty years. You're not going to get any coconuts from it. Stuart? Wait, let- I have to ask you a question. Wait, uh, are you saying that Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones do not appear in this movie? They're, they are never in, in this movie. Never in this I, movie. Have to, I have to assume their characters died between films. And so Nor now- are they mentioned. And they're never mentioned. And it's, yeah, at Rip Torn, who, you know, of course passed, but he's not mentioned in the movie, even though he's the head of the organization in the old one. There's, this is, it's almost like this is an offshoot from a different reality where- the agents we came to know and love in the original Men in Black movies, they don't exist. This is a totally different system. And yeah. uh, there's so, Dan, but some of his personality change, I think, is supposed to be because of what happened to him in Paris that night. Oh, so you think, okay. You think it's a bit. So, well, that's even worse, though, because then the Men in Black are going around making everyone loopy with their neuralizers. Yeah. Uh, spoiler when, alert when, for the. When you the use end, the neuralizer, but... you turn everyone into like a, into like a big, boorish kind of like, a big you goof. know, boozy goof. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so 
Molly is now Agent M. She takes a turbo subway to London. This is this turbo subway that no one on the subway seems to seems to be ready for the propulsion okay, and the okay. thrust. I, They're always all their stuff is flying out of their hands. And it's like I thought you commuted on this. I have a big problem with this gag too because we get to the subway. The subway looks like a traditional grimy subway. It looks much like any New York subway might. But there are a bunch of aliens walking. Well, not those new stations up on. Not the new stations in the Upper East Side. Alex, let me get my point (laughs) out. I'm just saying those are really clean. (laughs) Okay, there are a bunch of aliens out on the platform. Clearly, this Uh is a Men in Black platform, and she gets Mm -hmm. onto this train, and then the train transforms into, you know, gleaming uh, uh, science fiction Men in Black train. Yeah, and zooms to another Men in Black platform with a bunch of aliens. Uh-huh. I'm like, why are you camouflaging this train? What <laughs> possible reason it's is a, there it's for a this? It's a visual gag for the audience, Dan. That's why yeah. they did it. Yeah. Okay, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, I, you're following Chris Hemsworth's, Hemsworth's uh, storyline. Where is Liam Neeson? Okay, so we're going to see him. So that's the thing. So uh, uh, Molly is about <laughs> to meet him. Good, it's, a, it's a good question. But anyway, uh, Aunt Molly, Agent M, she shows up in London. She pets this little alien that, that dissolves into little, like, mischievous critters. But that scene ends before anything really happens with it. Suddenly, we're in Marrakesh, where a janitor gets melted by two energy beings who— they steal his, his form, right? Because they yeah. turn into lay, lay twins, yeah. the, yeah, uh, the he, twin he breakdance duo. The janitor dances a little bit, too, so you got to know he's, that it's the same, same moves. That's right. Yeah. So Lay Twins are showing up in their second Flophouse episode after appearing in Cats, the movie. Now, uh, now, Elliot, were they the cats that uh, were dancing with the sneakers on? Is that yes? Who they were? They're breakdancing okay. cats. That's all they do. They're breakdancers, Dan. That's what they, if okay. you see breakdancers in a movie and there's two of them, I it's understand them. who breakdancers are. I'm just. I, I just want to say I loved the movie Cats. Oh, yeah. it was so amazing! It's I great. went to the movie theater with one of my best friends. We laughed so we were. We were the only ones there. We were just weeping when each <laughs> Bruce Elba comes out naked, basically looking like a naked person. <laughs> just a naked man who's, who's like a cat, right? His yeah. penis was stolen. Yeah, it was totally a, a, a neutered, a neutered Idris Elba, um, totally naked but strangely furry. I just, I just laughed so hard. I, I appreciate that. I, mm-hmm. I. I I mean, there's not a lot that can do, you know, you need that. So thank you, <laughs> Andrew Lloyd <laughs> Webber, for yep. that, you know, giving us, giving us that. That movie it came out at the, it, yeah, it came out at the wrong time. It came out before the pandemic. If it had come out now when people needed a laugh, it would be the biggest movie in the history of the world. It would be. <laughs> Back to well, the so- Max, this movie. So, Lay Twins, they go to this, this, these energy beings, they go to this secret workshop where these tiny little aliens live, and there's like a queen alien and her little pawns, and they say, We need something that we can use to kill this Jababian prince. The Jababians are aliens. We're back to London, <laughs> yeah. and here's where we see uh, uh, T, Liam Neeson. He's met Molly very briefly, and now he is holding like a little uh, briefing session. H is kind of in trouble. For his unauthorized smuggler sting operation, but not really. They kind of shrugged yeah. it off pretty easily. And T assigns him to chaperone Vungus, a visiting member of the Jabavian royal family. This is the assassination target. Yeah. Uh, turns out they're old, they're old partying buddies, and Chris Hemsworth has an unending stream of stories that he tells about him and Vungus hanging out. And when they finally meet, it doesn't and seem like those, they really like yeah, each other that none much. None of those stories sound that much fun. No. They well, they're feel like, like a, first drafts. <laughs> Oh, and uh, Molly is like, uh, she says to H, uh, here's a dossier about Jababians that I wrote. I should be your partner. I know all about them. I speak their language. And he's and she's kind of lying, but he likes that she's lying and thinks he can use her in some way. So he goes, okay, you come with me. It's your classic straight arrow, loose cannon matchup, except really personality-wise, they're kind of similar. There's not that. It's And I think they thought, we're going to match. Chris Hemsworth and Tessa Thompson were so good together in Thor Ragnarok. Let's build a whole Men in Black movie around them. And they just don't have. But it's weird because in Thor Ragnarok, Tessa Thompson is the loose cannon, and Thor is the straight arrow. But yeah. here they decided to, they did they pulled an Ishtar and they decided to switch up their personalities. And I don't I, they didn't really do it that well. Now, Ellie, I I gotta say, I look, I'll tip my hand a little bit. I didn't mind this movie. I'll talk about it more in the final judgments. But part of the reason I didn't mind is like this: the screenplay is is completely boilerplate. There's not much going on there. But Tessa Thompson and Chris Hemsworth are two of the most attractive, charming people 
existing on Earth today. Well, and so that, I'm kind of happy just to see them, like, goof around a little. Well, that's what I've just felt like the whole time I was watching the movie, I was like, what could these two be doing with a movie that gave them, like, more fun yeah. stuff to do? Like, they're so much yeah, better than this material, you know? It's like a... I w- and I'll say the same for Kamel Nanjiani uh, and uh, Rebecca Ferguson later. Yeah, yeah. again... The whole cast, down the line. Great cast. (laughs) Emma Thompson and Liam Neeson, of course, not capable of that much. So here I was like, I was like, (laughs) wow. It's a joke, guys. Come on. You know I'm joking. I would never say that about Nanny McPhee. Come on. Uh, So so they go to. Uh, Can I? I, can I just say, I, I love Emma Thompson so much that Mm -hmm. she's, you know, the thing about her is that she's super you know, Shakespearean trained British mm-hmm. actress. And she's just will go for these things. Like, I just, I thought she was great in Natty McPhee. I, you know, like the, just the, the way she embraced like the bad teeth thing. Like she oh, just, yeah. she just go there. She did she Shakespeare doesn't... and stuff through like, you know, she was with Kenneth Branagh uh, uh, and that was kind of her breakthrough to America when, when she did those movies. With, but like, she started out doing sketch comedy. Like she has a comedy background and she's very funny. That's why she's so good in Late Night, your favorite movie. Uh, <laughs> God damn, that movie is so bad. Like I, I haven't I lo- seen it. I like the people involved, but it yeah. gets everything wrong about about working as a late night writer. Dan, you told me thing. you were up you were up till four AM for a whole week just updating the goofs section on IMDb yeah, I, about well, late night. No, I just like I watched it because like around like it you know, it showed up on Amazon and just around the Daily Show office there was this like quiet buzz among some of the writers like have you seen this yet have you seen it like it was you know not since studio 60 on the sunset strip uh have uh late night writers hate watched a thing in such i remember those years when i remember when studio 60 was was all the rage around those offices yeah that yeah. was that was a fun time okay so m and h they or h and m as i'll call them because if you need if it's stylish but it's cheap you know it's like you can finally afford style <laughs> thanks Stuart. i they, can't uh, tell whether that was genuine or not from Stuart. That's no it was way. not i don't think so <laughs> okay. i think Stuart started off faking a laugh and then started laughing at his own <laughs> fake laugh and so it turned genuine so they go to a literal underground club it's literally under the ground where uh-huh. fungus is just hanging out all alone this guy filled who with needs people an, filled with human beings human beings and aliens uh-huh. this, these guys that this guy who has been assigned a chaperone because he's a target of assassination is hanging out of the club by himself with yeah. no security. And Vungus instantly is horn dogging all over M, but then suddenly Vungus is all business and he needs to tell H something. But H is like, no, let's come on, let's dance. And Vungus is like, you've changed H. Uh-huh. That's when Lay Twins come in, they break dance all over the place, and they yep. shoot this little like assassin missile at Vungus and he gets sick. And H, yeah. because it's his job to chaperone Vungus, puts him in a car and sends him home, and then the car blows up. It's like you've I, so wait, failed at every aspect up, of the job. Did the car yes. blow up from the thing those guys shot him with? I don't. Or was that, that I just was completely not sure. unrelated? I, I couldn't figure it out, and I'm glad you guys had the same question, because I was well, like, maybe I looked away. I don't know. Especially because if it was shot into him, it seems like if it blew up, it should blow him up. But he is intact. He, like, dies a little bit after that, and the car blows up. I also want to—this is a very small thing that I'm going to talk about now, but, like, you know, what what is this podcast for, if not that? Uh, They make a big point in the script. Like, like Chris Hemsworth is like, uh, vodka cranberry, that's your drink still, right? Vodka cranberry? And he comes back only with— champagne from the bar and i'm like why would you make a point like, of having a Stewart specific bartending? drink that is like like vivid red why would you do anyway sorry that was <laughs> i'm surprised that Stewart didn't have an issue with that since he works in the liquor trade by the but, way that's not listed on the goofs in imdb i checked so if any oh, enterprising <laughs> listener wants to what does that mean you work in the liquor trade uh, I own a couple of bars in Brooklyn. <laughs> he, oh, that's he, right. Oh, okay. He sails a boat off the Barbary Coast. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I know you have bars, but like that, that somehow or another, the phrase, in the liquor trade, I, it uh-huh. just sounded so Jack Sparrow. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's like, wait, what do you do? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I hit people on that with coconuts. Yeah, uh, when, you, when you think about it, the black... The Black Pearl from Pirates of the Caribbean was the original party boat, when you think about it. Yeah. Mm, I'm not going to think about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, I can't force uh, you to. <laughs> so so they, they have, like, a pretty pro uh, protracted battle out in the street where our heroes are blasting these two dancing uh, energy beings. 
Um, and they just keep pulling guns out of the car. That was pretty cool. It was like a Lego was, set that turns into guns. There's a funny bit where they keep pulling pieces off of this car to reveal larger and larger laser yeah. guns. Uh, and I gotta say, get, I, the, the, I will say, I will say, there. I did have an issue with the scene where the two men in black they they start this off with uh, at gunpoint, telling these two men of color to get down on the ground and get their hands on the ground. And I was like, mm-hmm. not good optics for right yeah. now, Men in Black International. But yeah. once you know that they can blow up the ground with their hands. Then it's like okay, this is not yeah. a this is not a fair fight. They are that was energy. It beams. is interesting how these things age, you know, in in light of well, first of all, I'm saying this as a white person who wasn't always thinking yeah. about this at top of mind for sure. But uh, in Men in Black Three, Will Smith is stopped because two police officers don't know. It, he's back in 1969. And he stopped because they can't believe a black man would be driving an expensive car and own it and it wouldn't be stolen. Mm-hmm. And he says something like, "When don't stop black men for driving nice cars or whatever. And, you know, like my, my, uh, I just sort of, my heart stopped for a minute. And, you know, I mean, of course, I, again, like I, that, that wasn't top of, it would be top of mind for many other viewers always, but, uh, it is a strange uh, um, thing, I think, how much, and this is to be seen in the future, our times we're living in will affect how, you know, depictions of, of, of entertainment. It'll be interesting to see the entertainment that emerges. I feel like we're in such a, a transformative time. It's going to be interesting to see what comes out of this it moment. Must, it must yeah. be really tough to be an entertainment executive and have to be like, oh no, are we going to accidentally make people mad because we had this scene in The Mandalorian where Baby Yoda's just jacking it? <laughs> well, I mean, that's... Is that, did, I haven't seen season two yet, or season one. Does that happen, or...? I mean, it it might happen, Elliot. I haven't watched season two yet. I mean, I guess when Baby Yoda becomes adolescent Yoda... It and it was goes probably about... fine when it when they made it, but maybe in the future, <laughs> no, opinions I... might change. You never know. I, no, I, I just actually... <laughs> I can't even believe I'm just saying this. I just had a, a kickoff call on a script I'm writing with uh-huh. Burn Network, and I forgot to ask uh, what universe we're in in terms of COVID, not COVID, yeah. COVID, post-COVID. I, I, I've got to call the producers on Monday. I, <laughs> yeah, I yeah. don't know. I, you know, how how do you just not deal with that yeah it's hard it's hard like the show i'm working on now it's an animated show so it's not going to be on the air until spring of next year and like we we're just like okay that for the purposes of this show it's just what what life used to be like yeah and hopefully it'll be like that again like i I wrote an episode where it's fourth of july at the beach and there's just a ton of people around and it was like all right okay i'm not like uh i just have to pretend this is an alternate universe where covid is not keeping things like that from happening Oh, yeah. so you're not like writing characters like so and so's name, and then in in uh, parentheses wearing a mask. Yeah, no, thirties, <laughs> uh, sassy and clever wearing a mask. Like that's yeah. all the all the characters. All right. Well, I'm here. sure that all the listeners are interested in this non Men in Black inside baseball. But <laughs> what, what's going on in the movie? All right. So anyway, a bunch of Men in Black guys show up, but and stop these energy beings, but not until Vungus tells M secretly that something is wrong at the Men in Black and gives her a crystal device, and then he dies. And she goes, "What is this?" And he's like, "The only thing that can save you, Ugh, or something like that." Uh, and a yeah. ton of em- ton of agents show up, and the energy dudes disappear. Could I just say, uh, just a little lesson to? I just want to, you know, uh, for people in movies who are about to die. You know, maybe take. Oh, my good. Online... A lot of them will. A lot of them will hear this. Yeah. Yeah. Take take my correspondence course, which is what to say when you're about to die, which is not something cryptic. Is bit like that's the I, I to boil down my course to one sentence. Don't say something cryptic. No, say... you want to say something like "check, please," and then die. <laughs> well, like something yeah, you memorable, say something and hilarious. Funny. What or, should or... A character say? I'd like to hear this. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean like <laughs> the. Say uh, the horde has <laughs> infiltrated uh, Men in Black. The use hive. this, the hive. Use Wait, this. Did they to then kill should have them. said the horde from Shira, Princess of Power? Oh, or, well, you mean the hive. or split. The uh-huh. point is, you know, actually give instructions. Explain why you were giving this to them and give instructions. Don't just be like, "This is the only thing to keep you safe." I will not 
hand over the instruction booklet that's also yeah. in my other pocket, yeah. like yeah. Or whatever. Can, well, much, it's possible that character has been a dungeon master in role playing games, and it's like I don't uh-huh. want to railroad you, so I won't tell you what to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's similar to that. I would like movie characters who are uh, telling, revealing. Uh, big secrets to also do that similarly where it's like yes you know if this movie was about someone finding out there's aliens and a government agent is like this goes farther than you think there's a bigger world out there just tell me there's a bunch of aliens like just tell me yeah. the thing you wanted to tell me you know or if you're like having like a romantic argument don't just be like Catherine, Catherine, wait Catherine, Catherine. be like hey i didn't sleep with her like she was my cousin like or like whatever the fucking dumb romantic complication is don't just be like but if you'll just give me, but can you, but... <laughs> You're saying, don't waste time saying I can explain. Just say the yes, explanation. Yes, uh-huh. just say the thing. Yeah. Just tell them that you were rehearsing for a play. Anyway, so... Exactly. I don't uh, think it's Catherine's fault, though. I mean, you left the door unlocked. It was a really weird situation. Like, the lights were low, and you had that one, that one thing I'm not going to relitigate this with drink. you, Stefan. <laughs> or Stefan. <laughs> Stuart. Why do I call you <laughs> Stefan? Well, My Stuart other friend who starts with an S-T... Stefan is your pet name for Stuart. I mean, you haven't got, known each other uh, that long. It's only been, what, yes, about 25 Stephen years? Stefan is my, my new erotic fiction uh, writing <laughs> name. <Yeah. laughs> but same last name, right? Still Stefan yeah, Wellington? Stefan Wellington. I'm, I'm throwing <laughs> yeah. people off the scent because they'd be like, if Stuart actually had uh, a pen name, he would probably change the last name, so this can't be him. <laughs> And yeah. what kind of erotic fan fiction is it? Fiction is this is dinosaur fiction, swamp monster fiction, that kind of stuff, caveman. I mean, it's to be honest, it's mainly uh, it's like slice of life stuff, and it's a lot of it's mainly misunderstandings. There's actually no okay. erotic stuff happening. No, I think uh, <laughs> Stephen Wellington writes Twilight fan fiction. Oh mm-hmm. wow! And maybe it could be about say like a young woman who <laughs> starts uh gets a job working for like a high powered rich guy mm-hmm. and yeah. BDSM is involved maybe I don't know we'll uh-huh. figure it out I'm I'm still working on it No sorry Stuart it's called Shop Girl by Steve Martin it's been written already also, so anyway Also Stuart you miss you you mispronounced slice of drife Oh, yeah, I, right. I assume you're writing slice of, oh, slice of dry. That's a callback uh, to what the what ep- that was a a different Hemsworth who did that ep- who has did that movie, right? <laughs> yeah. So, I have no I have no recollection. I just remember that we did dumb we did phrase. a movie about a where that was I think a Liam Hemsworth vehicle that Richard Dreyfus was in, in which we pitched a movie called Strice, Slice of Drive, <laughs> where it's just Richard Dreyfus's normal life. Okay, so back at HQ, uh, there's an Agent C who hates Agent H, Wait, and he's Paul. like, yeah, and he's like, you and M should be fired, and T is like. No, 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 the Hive might be involved in this. And M trying to think fast to save their jobs is like, uh, I think there might be a mole in the Men in Black. And H, and uh, they're like, okay, C, you and M work together. H, you're on probation. And H is like, got it. And then walks over to C and M is like, I'm in charge. Uh, M, come with me. Elliot, I think you're right about Elliot, this mole. you're doing this summary and just listing their, the first letter of their names <laughs> feels like I'm reading a Reddit Am I the Asshole thread. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we might have to use their actor names. Um, I also want to say Rafe Spall I found very funny in this, and I liked him and uh, Hemsworth's uh, back and forth. I, I thought he was pretty He's really always good. good. He's yeah. When is he not yeah. great? He's just like an original human being. He's yeah, yeah. so much fun to watch, you know. Or Thanks. a small, a, la- a very large hamster. Oh, well, yeah, either, either of the two. <laughs> oh, you know what? And I forgot he was also in another Flophouse movie, Jurassic World. Fallen Kingdom. So anyway, this is second for Rafe Spall. Uh, so we got a lot of we got a lot of seconds in this one. So uh, where are heroes going to go? Marrakesh. They've got to find the people who made the weapon that killed Vungus first. I don't know why they stop off at a guy who has an alien that he wears as a beard, and they're fixing the <laughs> hover bike. Played by, uh, play by Nandor from uh, What We Do in the Shadows. The guy. Who oh Nandor. right, that's who that is. I knew yeah, I, I recognized him, and I yeah. I, yeah. I did enjoy a scene where the alien was annoying him, and he just yeah. keeps slapping his own beard. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it, but it was like it was it was just a. I don't know why they made that stop. I don't understand. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't I guess understand. they had to, maybe they had to find out information from him. They go to yeah. the workshop. They find that all of these little aliens have been murdered by the energy beings. We assume all that's left is one tiny little pawn, played by uh, voiced by Kumail Nanjiani. Uh, like many of the aliens in the movies, he is both unaware of certain earth customs and very aware of earth pop culture Mm -hmm. so he knows all about like the movie the notebook but he doesn't seem to understand that women in most earth cultures are not monarchs that need uh vassals you know yeah it's it's the laziest kind of character 
character like description where they're like we're going to give this character a little bit but it's mainly going to be a joke delivery system which i mean yeah. if you're going to get camille nanjiani he's going to be good at it at least he's going to be he, good at it i mean he this, he's the movie's alf i guess where it's like well, i don't understand these human customs let me tell you about richard Gere. you know mm-hmm. And he look he looks I mean he's smaller but he looks a little bit like a a Babu Frick except for he talks like Kumail Nanjiani instead of like hey it's me Babu Frick ah. no no Babu Babu Frick was such a was such an original wonder he mm-hmm. was he was so great he made no pop culture references because of course that was the Star Wars universe but he Babu Frick as I said my second favorite character from that movie after the chimp with a Cyclops visor who fixes <laughs> uh, Kylo Ren's helmet uh-huh. anyway. Uh, <laughs> if there was an, a, a, there's a Babu Frick uh, chimp with Cyclops Pfizer spinoff, I'd watch that for sure. So uh, H convinces the pawn, you should be, you, M should be your new queen because for some reason we've decided we want you with us. And H reveals that he took uh, the crystal device that Vungus had given to M because I forgot to mention M had handed it over to the men in black to for safekeeping. It's a, it's a MacGuffin. It's just, you know, she's yeah. got a crystal yeah. MacGuffin in her pocket. Mm-hmm. Uh, just like that. Uh, Hi, my this... name is Crystal McGuffin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me. I'm, a, I'm. Let me just get into your pocket for a moment. This is what I do professionally. It's okay. Uh, suddenly, uh, C is like, I don't trust those guys, and he sends a team of agents to Marrakesh to catch our heroes. Then the energy aliens show up, leading to perhaps. If I was going to describe hover bike chase through the Marrakesh street market, you would imagine something pretty fun. It is yeah. fairly lackluster. It is. It yeah. does not do great by the long uh, tradition of Arab street market uh, chase scenes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can, can I briefly say the the action in the movie not not very good as a rule. I do think that the effects are fun usually. Like it, it looks pretty good. It's a fun. Yeah, it looks fine. It's in the Men in Black zany alien universe, and none of it looks bad in now, the way that with, like a with lot that of... in mind, Annabelle. How did you feel about the action and the special effects in Men in Black 3, a movie that <laughs> I have not seen yet? <laughs> I felt very meh about it. Okay. I mean, I just I just felt like, I mean, the funny thing is, is there's a, a motorbike chase that is not that exciting in Men in Black oh, 3. It, it, it echoes. It echoes through time. <laughs> through verbiage, through time. Yeah. It's like somewhere in time. And uh, <laughs> yeah. no, it's like, it's, it's, it's you know... They're just, it's just not I don't know it just it's not popping for me yeah, you know yeah. uh, just it, it, it just all paled from the first men in black yeah. which just seemed to have some real spark of like something fresh mm-hmm. to that universe to that universe of films to that genre and it, and it, and like, it had uh, Barry Sonnenfeld at the helm right he, well, he did he, this he did the second one too I think uh-huh I don't know if he did the third but like that that first movie it was like they really did that premise right and uh-huh. they found all these like different ways to have fun with it and they it was like and they vincent squeezed all the juice out vincent d'onofrio vincent... delivers like an all-timer performance i mean you're not going to get a better villain than vincent d'onofrio playing a dead body with a cockroach alien inside of it and he moves <laughs> so well as if he's a dead body yeah. like he's so good he at do it. that in his sleep yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's <laughs> it just leaves you wishing it was better and yeah. that that's the most dissatisfying kind of movie yeah. i checked it barry so- barry sonnenfeld did all of the men in blacks i think that we forget like he came onto the scene really really strongly which uh means that we forget that he also has done a lot of terrible stuff like he did the like he came onto the scene did the adams family movies he did get shorty he did men in black mm-hmm. yeah but he right, also right. did wild wild west big trouble oh, yeah. men in black two uh well, the, the the cat movie with the uh, nine lives like he's he's been on a pretty big downward slide for a while unfortunately because i did like a lot of his early movies quite a bit yeah, I just watched Adam's Family Values the other night. It's amazing. It's great. Mm-hmm. That's a great sequel to a great, great original. And Get Shorty's is yeah. a lot of fun, Get too. Shorty's fantastic. That's a movie. Get Shorty's a movie I could watch, I think, every single day, and I would enjoy it every single time. What sure. a good movie. We should do it. We should do an episode about Get Shorty and how good it is. Uh-huh. I mean, we, we could do a good, good that, movie. That, but I would actually watch that. Episode. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so our heroes manage to escape because uh, they use the hyperdrive on the hover bike. And not as exciting as to this movie. Wait, there's more. There's a, oh, there's there's more. Yeah, yeah we we uh, have not reached the end yet. 
No. Uh, they end up in the desert. They smash the bike. They find out that the crystal is actually a super gun powered by a blue dwarf star. Uh, mm. It's disappointing that it just turns out to be a big gun, but it's a very powerful gun. It blows a yeah. big chasm in the desert. Meanwhile, and I can only imagine the like environmental repercussions that ex- making a giant chasm in the desert is going to cause for the local like ecosystem. Oh, it's. I mean, it's already a desert. So, but I'm sure there are life forms there. You know, it's. Uh, yeah. It's life finds a way, as was said in the movie. Well, just by kicking up all that debris into the atmosphere, like it's going to cause some problems, you know. Oh, that's true. It'll block out. It'll it'll be a year without a without a summer, and crops will fail all around the globe. Yeah, <laughs> I like right. I liked the <laughs> I like that goof that I I don't did I do it on the goofs episode the Jurassic Park one where like someone the goof was like you know Doctor Malcolm says life finds a way. This is not chaos theory, and if that was an explanation, nothing would be extinct. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you're right. It's a dumb line, really, when you think about it. <laughs> That's true. Uh, but it was so, delivered by Jeff Goldblum, so it's hard to yeah, get exactly. mad at it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So H is like, why did Vungus give you that weapon and not me? And M is like, Vungus said you changed, H. The beard alien from earlier shows up, steals her crystal weapon, and flies off. Uh, <laughs> and H is like, well, there's only one place that beard alien's going to take the weapon. To my ex-girlfriend, intergalactic arms dealer Riza Stavros, the merchant of death. And, and when, and, when and, he, they kept talking about Riza, and I'm like, he was dating Bobby Digital? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that would have been amazing. I would have liked that a lot. Uh, and M admits that Molly admits she's never been in love. Where are they going to go? To Riz's Island Fortress off the coast of Naples. Uh, this is when you're like, okay, so they just wanted to, they wanted to go to pretty places to, to go to hang out and shoot actually, movies. Actually, I mean, one thing about this movie, I, I actually feel like maybe I should just watch it with the sound off just to see places. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've gotten kind of hooked right now on binge watching shows that take place in in uh, remote locations in England. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say that I did have the thought while watching this movie. I'm like, maybe I'm being more easy on this movie because it is being Men in Black International. They are traveling the world, and I'm like, well, that's the thing I can't do right now. So yeah, it's fun to watch. <laughs> Unlike, I mean, because at home now you're just catching aliens and blanking up people's memories in your apartment. I know. And you really miss yeah. doing that in other places. Just, just walking hey. into the bathroom and being like, okay, all the what? aliens come out. I think everybody here would like to sign up to be neuralized for 2020. You know what I mean? Ugh. Get this year wiped out of our heads, Ugh. right? You <laughs> yeah, know what right. I mean? Yeah, you're right, Stu. Anyway, uh-huh. so uh, long story short, uh, it is not uh, the hip-hop legend Riza that they are going to see, but of course Riza Stavros, played by uh, Rebecca, Rebecca Ferguson. Ferguson. Yep. And she is like, they, they try to sneak into her fortress. H tries to charm her way in. They both get caught. Uh, and they're fighting each other, and then it turns out that the alien thug that H is fighting, who works for Riza, it's the same alien that Molly helped escape when she was a little girl, and so he helps them get the star gun crystal weapon yeah. back from Riza. And it you, is and you glossed a, over Riza's three armed fighting technique, which was pretty cool, kind of like uh, like Shiva from the Mortal Kombat movie. That's true. Or she movies, at, or, or uh, games. <laughs> yeah, they're kind of like uh, movies. They're so advanced. You know, the graphics yeah, are so or, killer. Or Spiral from the uh, from the X Men comics, yep. but it's I also it, it was the kind of movie where I feel like both Tessa Thompson and the movie kept forgetting that Riza has three arms, yep. and then she'd suddenly remember yeah. and use it to fight with. I did like the the line though that uh, you didn't mention here, where uh, uh, well, I can't Tessa Thompson, I can't reenact the whole movie. No, Dan. no, no, I gotta no. Skip I'm, some I'm of the dialogue. Specifying that uh, Tessa Thompson, uh, you know, like says back to the alien the thing that the alien said in alien language when she was young. To be like, oh, I'm the same, and she's like, he's like, what? And she asks what it is at a certain afterwards, and he's like, oh, it means uh, I will thank you, I will kill whoever you want me to in a protracted and violent manner, or something like that. Yeah. Whenever you ask me, and I'm like, that's hilarious. That, yeah. that that was the promise he made to this young girl that she didn't understand. So that the joke I laughed at during the movie was when Tessa wants to drive a car. She wants to drive the car and. and Chris Hemsworth is like, I'm going to drive. And Tessa Thompson races ahead of him and gets into what in America would be the driver's side seat and then yeah. is actually the passenger side seat because they're in England. I was like, that's a funny joke. I like yeah, that. Yeah, I liked it. Um, so anyway, uh, H&M, they're now friends. They tell each other their first names. I don't remember what H's first name was. Uh, but then the hives show up. Uh-oh, it's those energy aliens, and they want that weapon. And Chris Hemsworth gives a speech, and he's like, we'll do whatever it takes to keep our planet safe. And the aliens go, we will too. That's when the MIB agents show up and blow up the energy aliens. They're not in the movie anymore. 
And uh, Molly gives T, Liam Neeson, the crystal. But there's still 20 some odd minutes left in the movie. So we know the day hasn't been saved yet. What's going to happen? We also know that the movie's not over because we have it. We've seen movies before. And like when we're watching this, Audrey's like, do you think Liam Neeson's going to turn out to be the bad guy? And, and like this is before all like I'm like. I, the moment Liam Neeson came on screen, I'm like, he's the bad guy. <laughs> like, before we knew there was a mole in the Men in Black, this is the bad guy. It's a real Ed Harris and Geostorm yeah. situation. Yeah. Unless uh, unless Liam Neeson's family's taken, he's probably the bad guy. Yeah, unless there, there's wolves in the movie, Liam Neeson's probably the bad guy. How disappointing was that movie? That in the trailers, they made a big deal out of him breaking those airplane mini bottles and strapping them to his knuckles so he could fight a wolf. And that's yeah. the last minute of the movie. Yeah. Like, that's the, the end shot. of the yeah. movie. Uh-huh. What a disappointment. I was like, this movie's going to be fun. And that's it's these guys dying slowly in the winter, and then finally he fights a wolf. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. it happens like, off uh, camera. It's like, uh, it's like Meet Joe Black. Like, you meet him pretty early on, right? And then you're like, fuck it. Do I have to watch the rest of the movie now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they're they're back at MIBHQ. That's a lot of letters. Everyone's celebrating, but M and H suspects something is up, and they and C realize that T is a mole. More letters, guys, <laughs> and that God. he was actually and that uh, he's planning to give the star gun to the hive. And H is like, if everyone knows that T has betrayed the Men in Black, he's the most decorated Men in Black agent. It would ruin morale. So just which is let crazy because me... you're like, what about Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones from the earlier movies? Exactly. They were huge. Exactly. So maybe they don't exist in this reality. So he and M go to Paris, and I feel like M I've been neural- the previous movies have been neuralized out of my head. You know. Mm-hmm. And Tessa Thompson helps Chris Hemsworth realize he didn't stop the hive years ago. He was neuralized by T when T got taken over by the hive. And they confront T, and he's just a bad guy now. And he opens a portal for the hive, and he turns into a big tentacle monster. And they fight. And Molly gets knocked into the portal, and then Camille Nanjiani's pawn character, they remember he's there, he saves her. And H is like, T, I know there's still a man in there. Give me the weapon. Help me save the day. Mm-hmm. You said I was like a son to you. And T, in a moment of humanity, gives the crystal weapon back to H, and Molly repays this moment of humanity by using that gun to blow the shit out of Liam Neeson. <laughs> yeah. And then and the, the laser just goes through the wormhole and I think destroys the hive planet. So she's committed genocide in this last minute, you know? Well, yeah, and I also assumed, like, when he showed that moment of humanity, I'm like, oh, she's going to shoot into the portal and Liam Neeson is going to be released. But no, yeah, she yeah. blasts no, Liam shot Neeson. Shot right monster. through him. Yeah. Okay, so because I'm never going to see yeah. this movie, <laughs> sure. never, ever, not in this lifetime, unless not. the pandemic goes on. Okay, yeah. I might see it next week. Yeah. Okay, so wait a minute. Um, I just need to know what happens when Liam Neeson is revealed to be the alien. Uh-huh. Is it like a total alien creature, or is it part Liam Neeson, part alien? Because I did a movie once where I turned into an alien, uh-huh. and I hadn't. <laughs> the script entirely uh-huh. and so i didn't realize that it was like me turning into the alien until the day they we showed up and they're like okay what's your best alien voice and i was like <laughs> huh i read this only with my character name i never read the part where i turned in- i didn't realize i was the alien i was such an idiot so you've had all this time you're gonna this is the day is this gonna be the debut of that alien voice are you gonna give <laughs> give us a taste uh, okay so yeah it was a roger Corman movie. Let Great. me just put it that oh, way. Uh, oh, yeah. Really excellent. And uh, <laughs> by the way, in order to turn into the alien, I had to disrobe so the alien could come yeah. out. Yeah. Because the alien couldn't get through clothes. It was, a, I guess, yeah. a powerful alien, but clothes were a problem. Yeah. <laughs> so powerful that my clothes had to come. Yeah. It was a Roger <laughs> Corman movie. And so, I mean, I really did not have an alien voice ready. And I had to wear, like, eye contacts. They put the eye contacts oh, in, and no. it was just... And so I just kind of growled. I mean, I have to say, I really did not get... I did not have the imagination that I have now. Uh-huh. Also, having seen the Men in Black movies. Yeah. <laughs> now you know what aliens are like. They're like, hey, come on, what's this all about? Yeah, They all sound like that. <laughs> yeah. I could have really gone just like really high pitched or weird but it was more like like i don't know it was so stupid it was i <laughs> yeah. really well, i could go back in time and fix it i know that movie that roger corman movie could have been great yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this you'll be happy to know that uh as soon as liam neeson turns into an alien it's all cgi all the time he never had to get into any Makeup or yeah. prosthetics, and I don't think he even talks after that. He just growls. He did. He's one of those... he insists on taking his clothes off, though. 
Yeah, <laughs> That's did. true. Yeah, he does. He does disrobe, and it takes a while. Like he's doing a real. Mm-hmm. It's a real strip tease. Yeah. Yeah, and he's he, he, twirling he keeps his tie. eye contact with the camera the whole time too, which makes you very uncomfortable as a viewer. Yeah, he keeps as if saying he's daring you. That day when I showed up on set, like to my dressing room, my costume was in my room, and it was just a pair of earrings and a skirt. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. oh, that's terrible. So the movie's almost over. They've defeated the Hive, probably eliminated that race from the universe. Uh, o shows up at the scene, which is, again, the Eiffel Tower, and she's like, I always suspected something was going on with the London branch. It's like, well, good thing you never looked into it. Uh, yeah, M and is now... you sent your new recruit to, to like, ferret out the mole, <laughs> apparently, but... And- and she's she's like, M, you're now an official agent. And you get the neuralizer, and it's like, yeah, you think she, she's proved herself now, right? She saved the world. And H is named the probationary head of the London branch, even though it seems like he is the wrong guy for this job. Yeah, it yeah, seems yeah. like if anyone should get that job that we've met, it's C, who seems like more of an administrator, and H, yeah. whose main skills seem to be drinking and getting into fights that he barely gets out of, should not he, be he, running yeah, a, an he's operation. Being promoted above his his particular skill set. Yeah, yeah, like sometimes and, a really great comedy writer might not be the best manager of uh, like a team of comedy writers, right? <laughs> I'm just trying to I give mean, you guys, you know, something to latch. Often, your it's often the it. case. Uh, mm-hmm. So M is assigned to the New York office. It's a bittersweet goodbye between H and M. But later that morning, I guess it's like daybreak. M picks up H in his car. I guess he was just hanging around, thinking about mm-hmm. all his new responsibilities. And she says she's assigning Pawnee the uh, Kumail Nanjiani tiny alien to keep an eye on H. So he's just going to hang out with H. And she's like, he's like, let me tell you how to drive that car, this flying car that I forgot to mention they have. And she goes, I'm going to follow my gut. And it's like, that's what he told her to do is follow yeah. her gut. And then there are over 10 minutes of end credits. So yeah, the movie yeah. is shorter than I thought Which it would I, be. I fast forwarded through because like we were like, oh, surely if any movie has like an end credits thing or like some bloops, uh, it'll be this one. Nothing. It's going to have Rebecca Ferguson being like, I want my revenge on H or something like yeah. that. Uh-huh. But they didn't have anything. It's nothing. Uh, I, think okay. there have been, I think there have been enough possible franchise starters that had those end credit scenes and then there were no sequels that they're just like, let's take them out. Let's not put them in the movies anymore. Yeah. Come it's on. It's so interesting that this movie completely ignores Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith's characters because they don't really explain the premise of Men in Black to anybody. So they assume you already <laughs> know, but then they also like, are ra- it's just so weird. Okay. Um, okay. Well, this is uh, where we get to final judgments, where we say whether this is a good, bad movie, a bad, bad movie, or a movie we kind of like. Uh, Annabelle, uh, I will allow you to give your final judgment, of course, on <laughs> Men in Bat- Black 3, the film that you have now watched <laughs> twice. <laughs> and the, of, of all the things, I'm sorry that you had to watch it twice uh, because of this. But uh, what, what would you say about that movie? <laughs> wait, wait, give me my exact choices again. Yeah. If it's a good, bad movie, a bad, bad movie, or something you kind of liked. I'm going to say a bad, bad movie. Okay. Okay, well, uh, sorry, Tommy Lee Jones. Or, well, I guess it was mostly Josh Brolin. Sorry, Josh yeah. Brolin and Will Smith. What if, it was, what if it was Josh Groban who was playing a young Tommy Lee Jones? What? That would be interesting casting. Interesting. Mm-hmm. More mm-hmm. singing, I'd imagine. Probably more singing. Uh, although I don't know, maybe maybe Josh Brolin can sing. I don't know. I've never I've never heard him try. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know that that could have saved the script because again, it was that you know pulling at your heartstrings movie that I just I just want my fun in this yeah, yeah. in this in this series. So I'm gonna I, that was my vote on the movie that I watched incorrectly. Yeah. <laughs> well, spe- well, speaking of fun, I'll give my uh, judgment which I, I assume will be slightly different than my co-hosts based on uh, a little texting we did beforehand. I this is, uh, just... this is Let's pull back the curtain and say, uh, audience members, Dan likes to, instead of saving his, his thoughts until the podcast, he likes to text us immediately before recording and tell us what he thought about the to movie. And then if up, we dis- dude, to prime the and, pump. And then if we disagree with him, he's like, let's argue this out over the text right now. And I'm like, we're about to do this on a podcast. I like, let's save it. I didn't argue it out over the text. I... Uh... Uh, um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I it's it's going to be a surprise for the listener. I don't need it to be a surprise yeah, for you yeah, guys. Yeah. Fair, um, fair. Why, why get a genuine reaction? Sure. Okay. But you're saying? <laughs> um, no, I kind I kind of like this movie. Like and talking about just like fun. Like, look, I understand why this wasn't 
received like super well uh, and i get where like maybe if i saw it in the theater i would be more down on it whereas i saw it on a sunday morning at home and i'm like okay this is fun um but yeah i I'll also look i'll say something controversial <laughs> I like the original Men in Black. I don't like it as much as the world seems to like Men in Black. Like, I find it... Uh, okay. Time you to know, amend like, I... Dan's letterbox profile. <laughs> no, it's, it's Dan, good. Dan, just, get ready, it's... For the, just get ready for the hate mail. I know, gonna everyone's going to hate me. I, I think it's good. I think it's funny. I think the leads are very good in it. But I also am just like, okay, yeah, like, it seemed original as a movie, I think, because big blockbusters weren't as sort of casual about that stuff but then i don't even know if that's true i mean like like you know ghostbusters is a very silly uh big movie about special effects you've got stuff like beetlejuice which is just like wackadoo and i love it anyway so i i didn't have like this nostalgic attachment where i'm like they are ruining men in black i was just like oh i get to see my fun pals tessa and chris zip around and you know have fun and like i i i wonder I'm suspecting that Elliot's problem is partly that uh, they didn't react ever as if there were like any stakes to what was going on, that it felt too light. But I feel like that's always been part of Men in Black. Like, Don't they're... put words in my mouth, Dan. Don't put words in my mouth. I'm just mouth. suspecting you have your chance now, and you can say it now. I, I, I okay. kind of liked it. Point by point rebuttal. One, okay. Men in Black is the most original movie in the history of film. <laughs> okay. Number two, well, no, it's so that. But you mentioned Ghostbusters. Like the excitement of Men in Black is partly that it's Ghostbusters, but with aliens. Like yeah. it's you've got basically what they did with Ghostbusters, but it's aliens instead of ghosts. Great, I'm on board 100. percent With this, it's not that they didn't have stakes. It's that it's a very thin movie. There's not a lot going on, and yeah. even in terms, there's very min- it feels like an episode of the Men in Black TV show that doesn't exist. Where it's like, okay, we got to find this this. We're supposed to protect this guy. He has a mysterious object. We lost it for a couple minutes. We got it back. There's a mole. We saved the day. There's there's just not very much going on, and it's not yeah. funny enough or charismatic enough to get it, like it is trying to be almost like the to catch a thief of Men in Black movies, where you're That's like totally what I felt like, yeah. But it does, but it doesn't achieve that because it's like not funny enough or exciting enough, or I don't need a heavy duty plot. Like Annabelle was saying, like I don't need my heartstrings pulled when it's Ghostbusters, but with aliens. But mm-hmm. I want to have like. A lot of funny jokes and crazy stuff zipping around that feels like uh, a lot of effort was put into it. Almost like mm-hmm. there, it the whole movie kind of feels like um, there was there's a lack of uh, imagination, you might call it. And really, what is film but imagination made flesh? Stuart, continue. Oh wow! Uh, <laughs> so you, you gotta, didn't like it? You're saying bad? Do I gotta, well, I mean, I, I got to pick up from flesh, right? Okay. I, yes, from the word. I would but to put into our categories that never really adequately help me to rate a movie. It's yeah. not. I didn't really like it, but it, it's not like a bad bad movie. If like as I'll put it on my scale of if you're a kid and you're sick home from school, go ahead and watch Men in Black International. Like it'll pass the time while you're eating, like while you're sipping ginger ale and eating Cheerios or whatever, and just mm-hmm. like. The, I believe we, we've established that Gogurt is the thing that children eat. <laughs> Dinosaur-shaped chicken nuggets, yeah. But not yeah. when they're sick. You just said if you're a kid who's home and sick and you're out of school, like, do you know that would say, that must sound so good to so many people right yeah. now? Oh, that's <laughs> true. Yeah. Like, I'm not, I'm, anyway. All right. Well, then, okay, good point, good point. Well, if you've got two hours to kill, mm-hmm. uh, you might you could watch Men in Black International, but you could also watch movies that you're going to enjoy more. So, Stuart? If you've made it to the end of the internet, uh-huh. you yeah. might yeah. want to watch Men in Black. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm in the same boat as you, Elliot. I think it's a hard movie to, like, it's a hard movie to be mad at, but it's very, it felt very slim. And uh, there's just, and it felt very rote and not a lot yeah, of effort yeah. was put into it. Like, there's a lot of scenes early on where they're like, Tessa Thompson's character is like joining up and they could have just cut all that out. Like they didn't need to, it didn't really, I don't know. It, you know, it just, well, just the, the fact that it's like all my life, I've wanted to be one of the men in black, but I can't even find out where they're supposed to be. I found them. Can I join? Yes, you can join. Okay, great. I was like, like what, you could uh, are we going to put some complications? Or? You could just start with her joining, like, and be just like, start with this her first day. Yeah. She just showed up. Like, cause it's, know. cause it's, it's also know, like, we've know. really got, we've really got to establish why this character wants to be a super cool secret spy who gets to work with aliens. Like, no, I would believe that. I don't think you need to, I, you need to Yeah, that well, up. I will say, 
I wouldn't say that there's a lack of effort. I would say there's a lack of effort in the screenplay. The yes, screenplay is specifically what the problem is with this movie. I think that the other stuff in the movie, like everyone's doing their best with what they're given. I think it looks pretty good. Like yeah. it's just yeah, yeah. the screenplay is not there. But yeah, yeah. production wise, it's fine. Yeah. So that's okay. Dan McCoy says, run, don't walk to see Men in Black <laughs> International. Uh, Annabelle says, just don't go see Men in Black 3. And... <laughs> <laughs> the Beef and Dairy Network is a multi-award winning comedy podcast here on Maximum Fun, and I would recommend you listen to it. But don't just take it from me. What do the listeners have to say? I would rather stick a corkscrew inside my ear, twist it around and pull out my ear canal like a cork than listen to your stupid podcast ever again. Please stop contacting me. Hell would freeze over before I recommended this podcast, The Beef and Dairy Network, to anyone. Not in a million years. Actually, scratch that. Um, Make it a billion years. No, how long's infinity? That's the Beef and Dairy Network podcast, available at MaximumFun.org and at all good and some bad podcast platforms. Disgusting. Hi, I'm Jackie Cation. Hi, I'm Laurie Kilmartin. And we have a podcast called The Jackie and Laurie Show. Who are you, Laurie Kilmartin? Oh, my God. So much pressure. Uh, I'm a stand-up. I've been doing stand-up since 1987. Uh, I'm a writer for Conan. I've written a couple books, have a couple CDs out, have a special out. Who are you, Jackie? Well, I, too, am a stand-up comic since 1984. And uh, I do the road like a maniac and uh, don't have a cool writing job, but I have four albums out working on a new album. We talk about stand-up. We talk about uh, all the different parts of stand-up comedy. So that's the Jackie and Laurie show and you should subscribe on maximum fun if you want to hear that (laughs) and i would encourage you not to (laughs) unfortunately unfortunately annabelle can't join us for the rest of the episode is there anything you would like to plug or remind our audience about before you go uh yeah well yeah uh thank you for asking um you know uh comedian laura house and i we have this new little uh podcast called tiny victories um it's on maximum fun right here and uh yes why say it is and the thing (laughs) about it is it's uh a tiny podcast it's 15 minutes long we don't we 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 limit ourselves to that (laughs) and we have a we have it feels like a message is being sent to us possibly the most bloated podcast on max fun well, also, Stuart is, like, clearly dreaming of a world where <laughs> <laughs> you can do that. And the idea is that, you know, um, we we try to highlight the very tiny, inconsequential, small mercies that are keeping us going during this, uh, you know, uh, 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 flaming piece of shit year Mm -hmm. and uh uh, we have a criteria for what makes a tiny victory what makes a tiny victory is something that gives you joy or makes you feel like getting out of bed that is completely unnewsworthy that nobody (laughs) is inconsequential to the workings of the world like we have an episode about how i have found my happy place and it happens to be a traffic intersection in los angeles you know just 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 the kind of tiny, small, observational uh, things that are making it possible to survive. Laura House, actually the episode we have, another episode coming up where she, her um, fiance is a jazz trumpeter, but she doesn't really like jazz and she has her, her first jazzgasm and she shares that with us. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. I remember <laughs> when I had my first jazzgasm uh-huh. as a young man. I've had to fake so many jazzgasms. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's the show. You find us on Maximum Fun, and uh, and and that's it. So I hope people will uh, check it out. Uh, actually, we we have another episode. We just we just recorded about um, giving into hating the year twenty twenty and how satisfying that is because there's some really good merch. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's the I hate 2020 merch is just can't be beat. So, uh, mm. yeah, that, that's all, uh, our little endeavor, our little pandemic endeavor. So that's great. Excellent. Thanks a lot. No, thanks so, for coming on. Thank yeah, you. Thanks guys. for joining us. Uh, thank, thank you so much. much.
Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about movies. <laughs> Well, uh, we don't have uh, any ads this episode, but we do have a couple of Jumbotrons. We are mostly um, supported by listeners like you, but if you want to send a special message as a small business or a just a personal message, you can go to Maximum or a regular Fun. sized person. Org. Mm-hmm. Maximumfun.org forward slash Jumbotron. Elliot, I'm trying to give, give, give the URL so they can, uh, they can buy an ad. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we've got a couple of Jumbotrons. Uh, Elliot, why don't you go up first and read one? You got it. And this Jumbotron says, MC University is the podcast companion to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Hosts Malcolm and Justin traverse each film to explore how the characters and worlds build and change over time. We can't agree on which Iron Man is more underrated or if the Avengers is masterful or messy, but we do have one small fix to make Thor The Dark World watchable. We promise a mix of in-depth analysis and dumb awards like Best Tricep Flex and Steve's First Lie. Listen to MC University wherever you get your podcasts. That's right. Search for MC University, one word, wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe. Man, I gotta find out about that tricep flex. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. And I have a j- 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 jumbotron. It's Stuart's time to read. Everybody, clear the stage. This message <laughs> okay. is for James. This message is from Emma. Hey, but will you take care of Watson tonight? I'm tuckered out. Okay, thanks. Love always. Your bug. P.S. Happy anniversary. Mm-hmm. That was adorable. Thank you. It was. I also for like, a minute. For a minute, I was like, "Are they just using this as like the bulletin board?" Like, I'm, that's fine, I guess. But. I mean, please kind of. do. I, I uh, you know, I see these before I send them to you guys, and uh, <laughs> and I like how this one had a note just specifying that "but" was not a uh, a typo that mm-hmm. they meant to say "but." Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I just want to give a little uh, update. Um, you know, we had this uh, this live show for Exorcist to the Heretic. You can see that on our YouTube channel. It's up uh-huh. for all to enjoy. Uh, the you can see donation period slightly more crazy from having spent this much time in quarantine and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the the donation period for the raffle, uh, the charity raffle to get some Flophouse merch, has ended. I haven't chosen the winners randomly yet but i wanted to give everyone the totals um we got slightly more than 400 people uh donating so uh we're not going to do like an additional thing but we i'm sure are going to do more live events similar to this in the future um but money wise uh, Flophouse listeners donated $31,715.78. Uh, we are kicking in another 5000 so almost wow, uh, really 37000 yeah. to charity. Yeah, that was, that's amazing. Both times we've done this, I've been just like floored and blown away by the generosity of Flophouse listeners. And, I th- and it yes. really helps me to feel better about this show being otherwise a total pile of nonsense uh-huh. uh, mm-hmm. that our listeners have been so great at uh, helping the world with us. So thank you so much for doing that. Yeah. Um, I just have a note on my thing when I was, uh, Annabelle uh, mentioned Reddit uh, and I wrote down Reddit cause I've been meaning to say uh, Max fun has a Reddit. Uh, if you, it, unlike the rest of Reddit, it's not horrible. I mean, there's many nice people, corners on reddit but it's known for having not nice corners but the max fun corner is very good if you want to discuss the show but don't want to jump into our huge facebook group uh, i just want to encourage people to get on reddit because i'm jealous of how many uh comments other shows get and so i want to crush them you know um but elliot i assume you have uh something you want to say about maybe a children's book or something that you've written or something well, i mean i mean lines. i can if you want i do have sure. i do have a ch- newish children's book out shark and hippo it's available mm-hmm. in stores and online now order it through your local independent bookstore if you like the marx brothers and you have kids you might like shark and hippo it's me taking uh or let's say being inspired by uh the relationship between harpo and chico and bits they would do and in applying it to a story about a shark and a hippo the shark wants to go fishing and that hippo just will not give him the things that he is asking for it's available now and if you enjoy it and you haven't read my first book horse meets dog please do 
It's yeah. also available through your independent bookstore and online. I'm one. I'm I'm one of those things. I don't have kids, but I am a fan of the Marx Brothers. I bought uh, one just for myself, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, Stuart, do you want to say Thanks, any dude. personal plug? Yeah, uh, I own a couple of small bars in Brooklyn, New York. And so if you live in New York or Brooklyn and you want to support a local business, uh, we're doing uh, limited seating and we also have to go drinks. Uh, Come support us. And if you live in the United States, uh, we are also shipping out uh, T-shirts and hoodies. Uh, Sales have been so good that we constantly have to reorder both of those things. Uh, and I'm really blown away by everybody's generosity uh, and for coming out to help. Uh, it also means that uh, I'm doing a lot of uh, packing of shirts into envelopes, and sometimes it feels like I'm trying to stick a dog in a bathtub, but, you know, that's part of the fun. <laughs> uh, and I also, I mean, as long as we're mentioning, <laughs> as long as we're mentioning stuff, I wanted to say um, Elliot appeared on the next picture show recently oh wow talking about one of his favorite movies the Fall. A cool ser- that's a cool serious film podcast yeah if you that was a hear- real serious film podcast and i think they were not always uh-huh. totally taken with my jokes but <laughs> oh, i listened to it they seem to be laughing at you a lot was, was it, were there me. facial expressions that I was missing? <laughs> yeah. But uh, I was invited on to talk about one of my favorite movies, The Fall, uh, mm-hmm. because co-host Tasha Robinson is a big, big fan of it. And it was a great conversation about it. If you haven't seen the movie The Fall, I highly recommend it. But I think you'll still enjoy the conversation, even if you haven't. Man, I, I would love to be on that show just to talk to Tasha about her experiences with role-playing games. <laughs> because <laughs> she's also a big role-playing game enthusiast. It could and, happen. Yeah. You never know. Uh, but let's move on to letters from listeners. The first letter is from Max, last name withheld. Wait, Dan, are you saying, here come the letter cues, (laughs) questions from the listeners. Oh, yeah. Here come the letter cues. We're gonna answer those questions. It's the letter cues. It's the letter cues. Here come the letter cues. Uh, space stuff and then aliens too and we're kind of like secret police that have fancy technology and you don't need to know about them it's anti-democratic and it's a little bit scary when you think about the implications uh-huh. but we're stopping aliens these aliens sometimes they have like a head on a stick but it looks like a real person's head but it's actually a robot come the letter cues speaking of, speaking of men in black uh, <laughs> <laughs> where where do you Which think uh, chris do. hemsworth had to go buy uh buy a suit to make him, his shoulders look that broad do you do you, do you, does he have to go to a special store, like a big and broad like store? Like buy a suit I mean, to make them I'm, look that broad? I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah, because he looks really broad. great in those suits. Do you, you yeah, because he's a shit. very, very, very handsome man who's in incredible shape. Well, yeah. I'll tell you this: his secret is that he went to Men's Warehouse and uh-huh. he liked the way he looked in a suit. He <laughs> well, I thought, it. Yeah, he, his secret is he went to <laughs> Men's Warehouse too. and then he said, "Wait, I'm a big Hollywood star. Hold on," and he left and he got a bespoke suit made for him. Yeah, and he went to a tailor. I will say yeah. uh, Men's Warehouse is the place to go if you ever want to order a tuxedo and receive pants that are four sizes too large and look like you have elephant legs because <laughs> that's what happened to me before my sister's wedding. Oh, uh, that's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> did, it, did it come with like a giant wallet chain? <laughs> <laughs> it was like the guy was like, "Here's the outfit," and I was like, "These look ridiculous." He's like, "Yeah, you look like a clown." I was like, "Are there any other pants?" No, those are the only pants. It was rid- uh-huh. <laughs> so you you started a revival swing band. <laughs> yeah, I had, had to. to. I had to do it. Yeah. Um, hey, so Max writes, "Dear floppers, I've been thinking a lot about Bugsy Malone since Alan Parker's recent death." When I first saw it, I must have been about 10 years old, circa 1980, and among my cohort of tween boys, this movie was universally regarded as near perfect. No one would say it was as great as Star Wars, of course, because it fit into a different category. It was just an awesome movie made for us that we were too young to have seen in the theaters, but that some had on VHS or caught on TV. Before the onslaught of early 80s movies designed to win us over like Raiders, E.T., Goonies, Gremlins, etc., Bugsy Malone existed to tempt us with the violence that we thought we wanted, but instead gave us sweetness, friendship, and silliness that we really wanted. Now, of course, the movie is cloying and unwatchable, and the sexualization of a too young Jodie Foster and the other showgirls is disturbing. But what I would really like to see is a sequel featuring the original cast in a gritty neo-noir gangster drama about middle-aged nostalgia and loss. It would need to include Foster in another Oscar-worthy turn as the now-washed-up Tallulah 
real-life convicted fraudster John Cassie, Fat Sam, trying to return to an unfamiliar world after a long prison sentence, and in a redeeming Travolta and Pulp Fiction turn, Scott Baio is an aging Don who keeps getting pulled back into the rackets. My question, take a movie you love yeah, when you're impossible. younger. Yeah, impossible. There's no redemption for him. Unredeemable. <laughs> yeah. My question, take a movie you loved when you were younger. How would it have to be remade now to fit your current sensibilities, life experiences, and tastes? Thanks, guys. Max, last name withheld. Thank um, you for writing in, Max. You know who would not like this question? Alan Moore. Anyway, <laughs> Dan, what do you think? Uh, I mean, obviously, I don't know. There's so many movies I liked as a kid where I would just not necessarily change much other than like cutting out a few elements like i watched uh monster squad as part of a halloween marathon recently i'm like well there are like a couple of homophobic slurs up top that just can be snipped out no Mm -hmm. problem no need for them and the movie's great um but i think in general like it's just i don't know i there there are movies I mean, honestly, I'll say, I don't know that my sensibilities have changed that much. Uh, I'm I'm a big kid at heart. I think we all know that. Uh, yeah, yeah. But but there are things that I loved, like Time Bandits, as a kid. That kind of like now, even though, and disclaimer, uh, I, ha- I hate to have to do this, because, because, but like more and more of uh, Monty Python, I have to be like, uh, they're cranky old men who have bad views. But uh, but Time Bandits, as a kid, I loved it, and now, even though there's a lot in it, I still love. I'm baffled at my patience as a child like there's that whole sequence in the middle with the uh dearly recently departed sean connery that goes on for a long time and unlike the rest of the movie isn't particularly funny doesn't have a lot of visual interest and yeah oh see even as a kid i loved that whole the whole oh, really? agamemnon sequence because well, yeah. it's about him finding a finding a father figure yeah oh, okay. who abandons him at the end of the movie when his real parents blow up <laughs> yeah, he's yeah, alone I mean, in the world. I mean, they're not the same Hilarious dude. I don't think. I don't think that firefighter and Agamemnon are the same dude. Like, well, it mm-hmm. gives him a little like wink of recognition at the end. Well, that's because he's creepy, Sean Connery. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, what do you guys have to say about this? I don't know. Well, this it's it's interesting that you, there are certain things like it's like I'm not. I don't really want the things I liked as a kid like grown up up exactly. for me. You yeah, know, yeah. Uh, I am happier having them as kid stuff, but like. The way you talk about Time Bandits reminds me of the way I used to watch Godzilla movies when I was a kid, where I would sit through who knows how many scenes of scientists just kind of talking or, like, government officials just not doing much of anything to get to the monster parts. Mm-hmm. And it's like I want those scenes to be as exciting as the monster scenes. Luckily, they did it. It's called Shin Godzilla, and it's yeah. awesome. Uh, the funny thing is, like, I feel like with a lot of those movies and, like, with Time Bandits, like, I watch those movies a lot. So, like... I know there's, it's not just that I'm sitting through it because I know there's a monster later. Like, I know there's a monster. Like, I could just fast forward the tape, but I didn't. I just watched mm-hmm. it. Yeah. That's true. I mean, a, I, a movie that we watched a lot when I was a kid was Coming to America. And maybe if there was like, they updated it and maybe his son has to come to America and he's like looking for his son. But Eddie Murphy would never do another Coming to America, would he? <laughs> Stuart? Uh yeah, I mean they're making another coming to America. That's true. <laughs> that was that was the joke. But I'm trying to like it's funny the the movies that the movies that I that I can think of from when I was a kid. It's like uh it's more like I watched a bunch of movies where I was like, why were my parents letting me watch this movie when I was yeah. a kid? Yeah. yeah, like this is not a kid's movie, but uh huh. Like when my mom made me watch Creep Show too because she thought it was hilarious, but it fucked me up real bad. <laughs> yeah. In her defense, it is hilarious and it's great, but man, woof. Um. Uh, I don't know. Like, it's tough. I was thinking about this question a lot because I feel like so so many times, like, I don't know if updating things will make it <laughs> make it better. Like, there was a long time where, and I'm sure, like, a lot of nerds were would think of, like, oh, what if they could make this movie nowadays but with more modern special effects? But I don't know if that's, like, that doesn't matter as much anymore. Like, I don't know. Like, I feel like when we got better special effects, we realized, oh, better special effects doesn't necessarily make the movie any better. Like it's, you know, it's, uh, I don't know. I'm just rambling. But, um, uh, so, uh, there's a very, this is a, a thoughtful question that I don't have a good answer for is basically what I'm saying. Thank you, Max. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, (laughs) That's the motto of the flop house. Thanks for writing in Max. Go find those wild things. (laughs) Next email. Stop chasing your dog with a fork. 
<laughs> the next email is from Kevin Dillon. No, not that one. I, I broke with the long-standing last name withheld tradition to just give you uh, that give parenthetical. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. Uh, this is, uh, it says, I know the remit of the podcast is to watch a bad movie and talk about it. But has there ever been a movie or series of movies you wanted to cover for the show, even though it doesn't strictly fit the show's manifesto? Cheers for all the laughs, especially this year. All the best, Kevin. Um, I mean, this is this is interesting because, like, I don't know. I flatter our, I flatter myself that we offer some good criticism from time to time on this show, but I do also enjoy that it is a comedy show foremost at least in my mind maybe maybe not maybe not lately i don't know how many laughs you're getting who knows but uh <laughs> right into laugh how many laugh laughs in your computer and then send us the readout yeah. send us send, send <laughs> data. <laughs> you know do it, like do some ashy art if you laughing on a dot matrix printer and <laughs> yeah. mail that in I, mm-hmm. I, I guess be sure, I'm just be sure to that, tear like, off the little the little sprocket holes on the sides. We don't need those. Oh man, I had one of those printers. It was such a pain in the ass. <laughs> I enjoy thinking a little more seriously about movies, um, and my outlet these days have been like writing little letterbox reviews. But I don't know. I've never been like, oh, I wish we could do this other thing because I want to keep it so comedy focused. But I think if I did, it would be to examine a larger sort of filmography of a director i like and luckily blank check already does that so <laughs> yeah, i yeah. don't need to worry about it uh but yeah. what do you guys think uh yeah i mean i think it's uh usually it's things like thinking back to movies that came out before we started doing the show and thus mm-hmm. they fall kind of outside of the window and i'm sure we could go uh revisit them but like you know, we still haven't watched Bucky Larson yet, and I mean, that's just that's been, that's been, <laughs> and you've been talking there about like it a hangman's every news. week. <laughs> that's a perennial. Yeah, how yeah. could how could we not have it? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's there's a movie that came up during our Exorcist show that I can't remember what it is now. Where we were like, oh, that would be a great one to do a live show about. Uh, and Teen I don't remember Wolf? now. It might have been Teen Wolf. Teen Wolf. I feel like that's the movie. Teen Wolf is the one movie I'm thinking of where I'm like, maybe it's time for us to finally talk about teen we need to talk about teen wolf the sequel dude we need to talk about kevin yeah, yeah. Sp- sp- yeah. i mean also that would kind of explain some of yeah it would kind of explain some of kevin's behavior this this murderer is great at basketball yeah. don't you have a problem with the fact that he's a murderer would tilda swinton also get to be a, a werewolf in it though because i think she would really kill it she would be a great werewolf. And John C. Riley would have been a great werewolf. Man. Yeah, but John C. Riley's going to be. I mean, he, he could. I mean, now we're just talking about making a new Teen Wolf movie, and John C. Riley could totally be the dad in that. But we don't He'd know. He'd be great. Uh, wait, did did Kevin kill uh, John C. Riley in that movie with a bow and arrow or a gun? I think I it was a remember. bow and arrow. And was it, was, a say, sil- was it a silver tip on that? Because I think mm. if he was a werewolf, he could survive it, right, guys? Sure, he, it just needs to have silver on there, yeah. And then he, and then it'll kill him. I know that like, if this movie existed in real life, Elliot would probably hate it because they would get the wrong people to work on it. Uh, but I do think a comedy remake of The Wolfman starring John C. Riley could be very funny. Oh, I like, think that I, it's it, it it's only the difference of is it going to be the kind of comedy where it's just ad lib nonstop, yeah. or is it going to be like a real movie that has jokes in it? He would be fantastic in that. No, Elliot, yeah. I want my comedies to have a complete like mirror image version that is just alternate takes that you can easily cobble to uh, sell in the DVD box. Mm-hmm. Well, it's like, are the, each of the scenes going to be sketches or are we going to have a real, cause there's a lot of, that would be really good. Dan, you should write that and then send it to John C. Riley. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, you know, I just got him in my contact list. So I'll you know, let me, I'll, I'll pick, <laughs> pick up my yellow pages. I'll see if I can find his address. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think just this look it up under the... Riley. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think this is the part where we talk about recommendations, movies that you probably should watch instead of Men in Black International. Uh Here come the recommendations, (laughs) movies we actually liked. Here come the movie Rex. Here come the movie Rex. Uh, Partly because I actually liked it quite a bit and partly to ignore, uh, ignore, to annoy Stuart. (laughs) What? Partly to annoy Stuart. I'm going to recommend. You're going to recommend Game of Thrones, the TV show or some (laughs) shit? (laughs) I'm going to recommend American Utopia, 
the David Byrne concert, uh, the Broadway show that was captured by Spike Lee and is available now on HBO Max. Um, it was captured by Spike Lee and kept in a cage in his basement. Kept, kept, <laughs> he put it in a little mason jar, and sometimes he would shake it to see it mm-hmm. get agitated. No, eventually uh, he got a good he got a bid from the National Zoo in Washington D.C., <laughs> and that's where it lives now. I. I uh, never smashed buy tickets so hard as when I got a chance to uh, see the show on Broadway. Uh, I was like, you know, I don't care. I don't care. I'm not going to look at the price. I David Byrne is doing a Broadway show. I'm going to see this. I saw it live on Broadway. It was a fantastic experience. And the movie is also a fantastic and different experience. You know, it's it's staged for the theater, obviously. So some of it... In, in a movie you're missing the experience of not only the immediacy but like seeing the whole stage at once but it is a very smartly shot movie in a way that you know uh stop making sense is it's not the movie that stop making sense is but no nothing could be as a concert movie that's really a high benchmark but it is a a very good movie a very joyful concert film and especially right now just something that's uh, fun and uplifting uh, American Utopia. I enjoyed it a lot. I can't wait to see it. I haven't watched it yet, but I can't wait to see it. What's that on HBO Max or something? I do believe so. Mm-hmm. Hobo Max. Hobo Max <laughs> is a hobo who wanders through the neighborhood collecting cans. <laughs> uh huh. But he's he's pretty extreme. He only collects Mountain Dew cans. Oh yeah, that's the they, Mountain Dew cans and Surge. Yeah, Code Code Red. Red. yeah. That's specifically all. the most yeah. extreme. Yeah, and, and uh, Takis, uh, but those aren't he's, cans. He's, that's he's that's the, pl- uh, bags. He's the hobo who has a GoPro. GoPro hobo, they call him Hobo Max. <laughs> hey, Elliot, you're already talking. Why don't you uh, recommend something? Oh, sure. I know it's uh, we're releasing this after Halloween and recording it after Halloween, so the time for horror movies is over. That being said, I finally got to watch a horror movie this month. I watched a, a new movie that's on uh, Netflix. Uh, it's called His House. Oh, I, uh, I watched some of that last night. It was great. Yeah, it's, uh, it's directed by Remy, Remy Weeks, and it stars Wonmi Masaku and Sope Dirisu. I'm sure I'm pronouncing their names wrong. And it tells the story about two uh, refugees from Sudan, a husband and wife, who are trying to restart their lives in England and are dealing with both the unsettling feeling of trying to start a new life in a place where they are seen as outsiders and they don't re- and they don't feel comfortable but also they are quite literally haunted by the things that they've left behind them and perhaps uh their history and it's really really well done it's uh, I thought it was really great and it just goes to show I think horror is and I'm not I'm not the first person to say this, and I'm not alone in it. It's probably the best genre for dealing with traumas that are hard to talk about through drama without coming off as either pretentious or luxury or cloying. And so it does a very good job of giving a little taste of the kind of post-traumatic uh, stress and feelings that come with being someone who's a refugee from a violent situation. But it's also just like a really solid, like really well done horror movie it's got lots of good scares and it looks beautiful so and the acting's great in it so his house now on netflix yeah i i, I you know i put that on last night after work and i was like oh uh, you know you you uh, are introduced to the characters and you find out that they're refugees and i'm like how can this be- movie be scarier than what they're already going through and then of course it you know is a scary movie <laughs> oh there's a scene where where uh where Rial, the the wife of the two, she is she has to get from the house that they've been given as a on a probationary uh, trial basis from the government to the doctor's office, and she's just getting lost in these streets and does not know how she can ask someone for help or how to get there. And it is it that that scene alone is frightening. Just yeah. feeling that lost, it just is. They did a really fantastic job with it. Sure. Uh, what have you seen the rest of though? E- equally serious, I'm going to recommend a movie called Welcome to Sudden Death. The hmm. sequel or remake or reboot of the Jean-Claude Van Damme uh, top tier action movie, Sudden Death. Uh, this movie does not feature Jean-Claude Van Damme or Powers Booth, I think, because Powers Booth died in the movie. Uh, his character, not the actor. <laughs> um, I mean, Powers Booth did die, though, didn't he? Yeah, but not in the filming of Sudden Death. It wasn't like, oh, I'm not going to make a weird joke. Um, okay, so uh, <laughs> this, movie, it, this movie stars action superstar Michael J. White. You may know him as 
Spawn, of course, mm-hmm. uh, where he takes over the role of a security guard. But this time, instead of uh, at a hockey arena, he's a security guard uh, at a basketball arena. You're probably wondering, but wait a minute. It's, it's called Welcome to Sudden Death. Basketball doesn't feature sudden death. You're worrying too much about this movie. Chill out. It's an action movie. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's fairly. It, it feels fairly cheap, but it's also super fun and dumb. Uh, it feels like a like a return to like just like sudden death, the Jean Claude Van Damme movie. It feels like a return to that kind of uh, uh, filmmaking. All the fight scenes kind of feel like uh, they 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 all have the setup of almost like a. Uh, the moment when a cutscene goes into an actual match in like a Mortal Kombat game, <laughs> and you're like, "Oh fuck, I gotta grab my controller." <laughs> I was too busy scanning Twitter or something. Um, and it uh, it's great. There's a great fight scene between Michael J. White and his uh, real life wife. <laughs> Man, that was a great line. Real life wife. Real life wife. Uh, Gillian White. Uh, that is both a great fight scene and also has the nuttiest ending of a fight scene. Uh, and there's also a fight scene in a locker room that is fucking sweet. So if you need to check your brain at the door and get a little bit of action in your life, welcome to Sudden Death. Now playing on Netflix. What is what is oh, it saying about us? And I gotta say, there's a fucking character in this movie named Gus who I can't tell if he's a ghost or if he's like <laughs> a figment of this guy's imagination. <laughs> It's. I've watched it a couple times, and I or a can't mule. tell. <laughs> I, I like any movie where you where you can base you can say I'm not sure if this character is a ghost. Or not. Yeah, there's so many scenes of him like, but like and like Gus will show up and he'll be it'll then he'll do like Benny Hill or like Benny Hill or like Scooby Doo style like running around uh, away from the terrorists. It's so weird. Oh man, it's great. Welcome to Sudden Death. Check it out. Uh, Elliot, I think you had an observation about our movie choices that you. you oh no, no, it's just I always I don't know why I always remember that that he is Spawn, and I never remember that he's Black Dynamite, even though I enjoyed yeah. Black Dynamite so much more than Spawn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I guess it's the first role you see somebody in. That's just what they. Although that's not even true because I saw him in the Tyson TV movie before I saw Spawn. Yeah. So I don't know what I don't know yeah, what it Black is. Yeah, Black Dynamite Spawn, is really great. It's I mean I it's because it's, it's Spawn like is such I feel like the Spawn movie is such a weird thing like it's such an artifact of superhero movies yeah there's uh, a, there's a, that scene where John Leguizamo as uh, what's Violator. his name o- Violator he's talking to a little girl and he has a balloon that turns into his own head and she does not react at all and I remember seeing that in theaters and being like wait so is this, what's going on here <laughs> like this is something a regular person will be terrified by yeah. <laughs> well guys. That's it. The show. It's called The Flophouse. We're on it. We host uh-huh. it. You listen to it. Was this just it. a trailer for The Flophouse? Because <laughs> wow. it's long. Yeah. Yeah, a, long a long trailer. trailer. A very unusual one, too. But, so um, in, the, in the middle of an episode of Jordan Jesse Go, there's just going to be a two-hour promo <laughs> yep. ad for yeah. Flophouse. <laughs> it's the only way we can get more, more listeners. Because <laughs> uh, short ads don't really give a, a good flavor. Anyway, uh... Listen, thank you to Jordan for editing the show and producing it. Thank you, Jordan to Cowling. Jordan Cowling. Mm-hmm. Thank you to Annabelle Gerwich for being our guest. Yep. Um, and for really, for ro- I thought she did a. I thought she did a great job, considering she hadn't seen a different movie. Considering she, it was not, bound to happen someday, and she yeah, was. Yeah, no, great. it really was. Yeah. I honestly thought one of us was going to be the first one to do it because we have done movies where. There are several other movies with the same title, uh-huh. and there have been like sort of panic texts back and forth every once in a while, being like, "Is this the one that I was supposed to watch?" That's why uh, I checked about Uninvited. I was like, "This is the movie, right? The one yeah. with the cat yeah. from the yeah. '80s," because uh-huh. there's like ten movies called Uninvited. Yeah. There was, but, uh, and there was that time, at least one time, I feel like when we were recording old style, Dan, you fell asleep through like a third of the movie, and we just rolled <laughs> yeah. with it, and that was great. Yep. So, you know, that's One the kind of, that's the kind of <laughs> rickety <laughs> enterprise we're running here. Yeah. Uh, but thank you for listening to it. Uh, and thanks to our network, Maximum Fun, for uh, being our network. But all things must come to an end, including this episode and me talking. So I've been Dan McCoy. I've been Stuart Wellington. And this is Elliot Kalen over here. Bye. <laughs> Uh,
catalog I only know from comic references to it. Yep. That line okay. of clothing I only know from, from comedy. Yeah. <laughs> MaximumFun.org Comedy and culture. Artist owned. Audience supported.